talk about um, something I'm calling the on-chain census, um, a way to prove the population of a digital community to achieve diplomatic recognition. And the digital community could be like a DAO or a startup society, or it could be something that we're calling a network state. And uh, let me just jump in and kind of explain what we mean. So I'm gonna talk about first um, the state of oracles, then the network state, then this constant on-chain census, and then wrap it all up. Okay, so first the state of oracles, right? So um, in 2022, oracles today are mainly used for price data. It's actually great that they are used. You know, five years ago, they were more theoretical. They're, you know, quite widely used as folks here know. Um, it's, uh, you know, price, while it might seem like an idiosyncratic place to begin for an outsider to the space, it's actually a good place to start because you can kind of think of, um, you know, price data, if you can transport it correctly, it's like Brinks trucks on the blockchain. You're you're using this information to guide multi-million dollar trades. And if you can secure that, then you can potentially secure other kinds of information, which it's not as profitable to, uh, to, to corrupt or what have you, okay? And so with that said though, you know, there's, there's a bunch of tools out there now, you know, with Chainlink, there's the, the VRF, uh, you know, API where you can, add random to smart contracts. There's the bi-directional stuff. So these are really good tools, but what can we use them for besides price related things themselves? And again, there's nothing wrong with price. As I said, it's a good place to start. But what I'm gonna talk about today is something that's not about price, but about censuses, um, meaning headcounts uh, for DAOs, for startup societies and for network states. So what is a network state? So, you know, uh, the, the fundamental concept is if we know that we can start new companies like Google and new communities like Facebook and new currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, can we start new cities or even new countries? And so, you know, I recently uh, put out a book on this exact topic. It's called The Network State. Um, best-selling book on how to start new countries, Ultra Journal bestseller. Um, that's a real list, by the way. The NYT bestseller list is fake. The Wall Street Journal list is actually based on actual sales data. The NYT list is just an editorial product, as they had to admit. Um, anyway, so the, the Network State best-selling book on how to start new countries, uh, it's also free online at the networkstate.com. So you can just go and, and take a look at it. And, uh, you know, it's a book-length treatment, but if you want the quick version, here is really an image of at least one of the core concepts of the Network State itself. And uh, you know, it's essentially like a social network, except rather than being um, like Facebook or Twitter, which have many individual communities within, you know, Twitter has 300 something million people and includes the Supreme Leader of Iran and it includes folks from the Chinese Communist Party and uh, you know, Americans of different stripes and, and folks who speak different languages. Those aren't really people of one community. They use Twitter, but it's no more a community than the water using community. All humans use water, right? Um, by contrast, if you imagine a social network that's a genuine community where all the people have something in common, they have the same moral values, and that community uses its cryptocurrency to crowdfund territory and network it together, that's kind of what a network state is. And here's like a visual of one that has, you know, uh, 1,729,314 people. And that's it in one image. Uh, here it is in one GIF where you start out in this example from one person in Tokyo and that they expand essentially their, uh, their community around the world. It starts with one person and then 10 people, then they've got a hundred and then a thousand and, and so on and so forth. Um, and with each leg up, they have more nodes in their you know, network archipelago and they have uh, a larger annual income and more people and a larger footprint, right? And so this is actually quite cool because you're in theory able to get something that is got the, uh, the scale in terms of population and square footage and income of a nation state, but it's decentralized, just like, you know, Bitcoin has the oomph and it has the, the size of a currency um, like of a, of a country, except it's a decentralized digital currency. It has no one geographic center. It's got a center in the digital space, but it's not. Um, it's got miners and nodes and stuff all over the world. So all that is good, except the problem is 
the network state, we're kind of assuming that this census at the top, this dashboard is accurate, right? This census has the verified netizens, it has the annual income of the network state in subscriptions for societies of service and it has this global real estate footprint. Um, and, you know, the thing is that that census, you know, it has to be uh, reliable. Um, you know, it's actually quite important. It's not just a network state that has a census. Uh, the United States actually has a census too. In fact, this is in the constitution. There's lots of stuff that's in the US that's not in the constitution. The census actually is it's used for many things, including resource allocation. And um, there's also, you know, the census or a census is used not just by the network state or the United States, but basically all states. They use their censuses for various things, among others, to be able to prove rank. It's not so much that countries are competing to be the biggest, but population numbers are used in many ways. And, you know, so China's number one, India's number two, the United States is number three in terms of population size. And actually, um, India is, I think, number one now, according to some metrics in terms of population size. So censuses are kind of used to prove rank, uh, though that's not their primary purpose, but they're used for many things. And um, one interesting point about these censuses is if you look at them, you realize that actually most countries are small countries. Um, you know, 38 countries in the UN have less than a million people. Reunion isn't a country, but Djibouti, you know, Fiji, et cetera. These are real countries that have less than a million people. Um, and there are 67 have less than 10 million people. And so the majority, you know, 38 plus 67 is actually greater than what's on this side. Only a relatively small number of countries, 14 countries have 100 million plus people. Most people live in big countries, but most countries are small. And that's actually an interesting point because um, if, we, if we combine it with another concept, which is that new coins use stats to prove rank, like coin market cap, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, the, the stats of market cap are used to prove rank among other coins. And to prove the rank among fiat currencies, so Bitcoin, if you go to fiatmarketcap.com, the much less known you know, um, cousin of, of coinmarketcap.com, uh, Bitcoin is number 26 worldwide in, you know, by market cap, you know, according to this sort of idiosyncratic measure relative to other fiat currencies. Okay, So we put all those pieces together. Um, that coins use stats to prove rank, that companies have censuses, uh, or rather the countries have censuses, and uh, that most countries are small countries. And we get the interesting kind of concept that a 1.7 million person network state would actually rank among the nation states of the world, somewhere in this example between Latvia and Bahrain, as a potential UN listed country. Um, just like a new coin would rank on coin market cap if its market cap got high enough, a new network state would rank among the states of the world if its verified population got large enough. Now, of course, the key question here is, you know, this has to be reliable, but if you could make this proven uh, and you could rank, you know, you'd essentially on the basis of just pure traction or the basis of a verified population, you'd sort of eventually demand respect uh, or you know, people would start giving you diplomatic recognition. Um, and why is that? Because you basically just have a large enough population and income to be able to sign deals that were on par with the sovereign. You could have a sovereign wealth fund. You could you could do deals that were on um, and on par with the sovereign. Just you would be a different kind of sovereign. And of course, you get laughed at the first time, the second time, the fifth time. But Bitcoin was laughed at too. Ethereum was laughed at. And now today. Um, you know, Wyoming has given legal recognition to Ethereum. It's basically integrated with Ethereum. Uh, El Salvador has effectively diplomatically recognized Bitcoin. So these nation states have recognized these decentralized networks. And we might think of the concept of diplomatic recognition. This is These are both examples of diplomatic recognition of a by a centralized state of a decentralized network. We could actually look to formalize this and actually look to seek this as a goal Given a large enough online community, can we get diplomatic recognition from a legacy country? I think that is possible, but only if that on-chain census is actually reliable. So that gets us to the third concept, which is the on-chain census. So again, as we said, as this network society grows, it proves its scale to others through the mechanism of this on-chain census. But immediately what people will say is, just because something is on chain doesn't make it true, right? Um, you could have, yes, there's an API here, you know, Chainlink or or something else can put it on chain, make it accessible to smart contracts. But 
that API could be false because um, putting it on chain, it gives you guarantees around the metadata, like who wrote the data and when and what was written via hash, assuming that the um, that that it's uh, this can't be unwound. There's some kind of proof of work style hash around it. So it gives you proofs around the metadata, but not around the data. Okay. So it's actually a non-obvious question. How do you create an auditable on-chain census? One where you have some degree of confidence in the, in the data on this number, right? So just drilling into that population number for a second, if we think about how that's actually represented under the hood, um, basically it's like a drill down where, you know, there's imagine a database which has 1,729,314 rows and each is a dot ETH. And you have a binary indicator from an Oracle saying this person is underscore human, right? That could be like an ENS field or something like that that's written to each of these. And you sum over this and that's how you get that population number. The, uh, the problem of course, is that, uh, you know, as we just said, the API that's saying this Oracle could be fallacious and that one could actually be a zero. And if it is zero, then the sum over this column affects this. And so it could be honestly erroneous or it could actually be malicious and it could be making it all up. They could all be bots and just be called humans or it could have something subtly different. It's saying, yes, they're all human, but they're not unique and they're all the same human. So they're not a unique human, right? So there's various ways in which um, you know, this could be screwed up. And so you know, how, do we, how do we fix this? Well, you know, there's the concept of the Oracle network, right? Where we have multiple Oracles um, and with and oracles, we can now look at measures of inter-rater reliability. So in this case, we went from just one oracle to two all the way to N. And um, here uh, we have, um, you know, this first oracle is calling Jim.eth human, but oracles two through N in this example are disagreeing. So unlikely that Jim.eth is actually human, or at least you'd have to have some reason to reject all these other guys. And conversely, Bob.eth over here is, um, you know, there's a disagreement only by Oracle 2, but not the other one. So maybe, you know, put that in yellow. Okay. And you can actually formalize all of this depending on how many raters you have and how much data you have. Um, you know, there's measures like Cohen's Kappa uh, and various other measures of inter rater reliability. If you know any stats, you can, between any pair of columns, you can form a contingency table, like a two by two, looking for 11100100 calculate things like chi-square and various other measures of correspondence between any pairwise you know, set of, uh, of binary indicator columns. And then you can form an N by N, um, basically a matrix, which has you know, the chi-squared stats for any I comma G pair of oracles. And you can basically see the extent to which, just speaking informally, these things correlate or predict each other or, or what have you, okay? And you know that might be very easy if you know stats or maybe gobbledygook. Point is, you can measure inter-rater reliability. There's ways of doing this. Once you have n oracles, you can look at how consistent they are, whether one of them is the odd man out, or whether they generally tend to correspond. And you start to reduce your dependence on a given oracle. Still, this is only relative truth. They could all be wrong in some systematic way. So you also have a mechanism for absolute truth, and that's um, your own data, where you spend the money to go and sample a subset of rows. In this case, we're showing you know, a sample of you know, basically five rows, but you'd have more than that, okay? Um, you wouldn't do all a million, but you sample a subset of N rows from this giant you know, 1 million row data set. And you actually spend the money to go and independently verify, is John.eth human? We say yes. Is Jim.eth human? We say no. Jane.eth, Bob.eth are human, yes. Food.eth is actually human, even though the data set said no. We just count up all the mismatches, okay? These are like defects. And you're essentially randomly sampling a few rows. You're, you're saying uh, there's some mismatches. And this is actually very analogous to um, like taking the output of a factory. It's got a million something widgets. You select randomly a subset of a hundred or a thousand, and uh, you inspect them and see how many are defective. And then you extrapolate that out to the entire set, okay? And um, this is there's various ways of doing this, but you're basically estimating the so-called sample proportion, the percentage of defects, right? And if your sample is genuinely random, and your verification is is good, and let's say you find only three percent mismatches, okay, in your own audit, 
then you know you can use some basic stats to kind of extrapolate that out and get a bound on uh, you know what's the probability that there's more than a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand fake you know, humans in, in this, uh, in this data set. It's very similar to the kind of stuff that Elon is arguing with Twitter with over, over bots. Okay. And so this concept of, uh, auditing the oracles can be done by you, or you could have a third party do it like, uh, you know, one of the big four, like a Deloitte, an EY, KPMG, a PWC, anybody can commission an independent audit, like a, you know, buy a big four auditor and just spend the money on a random sample of rows to determine whether this oracle is trustworthy. And of course you could apply this not just oracle one, but two through N, et cetera, right? Okay. So now you've actually got something where uh, you're not just trusting, you can verify. And if you're basing a big decision like diplomatic recognition or anything even just less than that, like, you know, listing or other kinds of things on this, you know, if you're uh, deciding to join that community, this allows you to do some independent due diligence. You're not just taking what's on chain on faith. Um, you can go and collect the data yourself, or you can look at Deloitte and EY and KPMG and PwC's audits of these or pay them to do an audit. And so we put all the pieces together to summarize. Um, we introduced the concept of starting a new country. Okay. We made this, you know, this visual, which has this distributed population, but because it's distributed, um, people don't necessarily know whether the number reported in a dashboard is real. Putting it on chain alone helps in terms of provenance. It gives you a, at least a supply chain. Every individual point here is a .eth and can be individually diligenced. But um, you know, if, if you're trying to rank among the countries of the world, we need to... Uh, have, have better proof than just self-report. And so we essentially described a methodology for what we call an auditable on-chain census, where that population number can be broken up into a bunch of Boolean variables. You can audit them and you can get effectively confidence intervals uh, on, on the uh, sampling distribution. You can figure out what is the likelihood that, that there's, these are all fake or some of them are fake or only 10 or 100 or 1,000, 10,000, et cetera, are fake, right? And this can be generalized, you know, beyond population, which is Boolean variables to uh, some of the other variables I mentioned, like income or real estate. It would just be something where rather than being ones and zeros, you have continuous variables, rather than contingency tables and chi-squareds, you'd have uh, scatter plots and, and correlations. And so if you're a stats person, you'll understand what I'm saying. If not, ask your statistician. Uh, but the, the point being that now we have a mechanism for getting an auditable on-chain census, which establishes the reality of network state, which potentially starts paving the way for diplomatic recognition of a completely new kind of entity. So thank you very much. Um, if you want more, uh, we've got a website at thenetworkstate.com, the book is free online. And I'm at Twitter at twitter.com, where you can DM me. So thank you very much. Yeah.